In this video, we are adding four more rules to our proof system, disjunction introduction, disjunction elimination, double negation, and a proof by contradiction, also known as reductio ad, ad absurdum, and also known as negation introduction or negation elimination. Okay, let's start with these two because these are the two most intuitive, I think, out of the entire video. The first one is disjunction introduction. Imagine I have a sentence P, which is, I like eating Captain Crunch. Now, as long as that's true, and we introduce some other thing Q, let's not give Q a truth value yet. I'm just going to ask you, is P or Q true in this case, the complex well-formed formula? And the answer is yes, because it's true if at least one of its disjuncts is true, and P is in fact true. So it doesn't matter what the value of Q is in this case. It could be zero or it could be one. The disjunction will still be true. So the idea with this junction introduction, we have something like P, is that in a subsequent line, we can then write P or Q, or we can introduce really any uh, well-formed formula after the or, because P is true. So we know that P or whatever we add is also going to be true. So an example, I like eating Captain Crunch, that's true. Therefore, the sentence, I like eating Captain Crunch, or I like eating radiation flakes for breakfast, is also true. Obviously, I don't like eating radiation flakes. Actually, to be honest, I don't like eating Captain Crunch either, but this is a video, and I can go a little bit wild if I want to. But that is disjunction introduction. We just add something to P, and then P or Q will be true. Okay, double negation. This comes from our truth trees and pretty much everything we've already done. This should be a little bit more intuitive. If we have not not P, uh, the negations cancel out and we get P. We can see this with truth values. So if you have P, not P, and not not p, well, if p is true, then not p is false, and then not not p is then true again because we negate not p. So double negation, we can just get rid of every two pairs of nots. Third one, disjunction elimination, a little bit less intuitive. But imagine we have something like p or q. Well, with p or q, we know at least one of those is true. So to get rid of this or sign, what we have to do is we have to think, well, what if P is true? What do we get? What if Q is true? What do we get? Now, if these both happen to get to the same result, then whether P is true or Q is true or whether both of them are true, we get that final result. So over here, we have P or Q in, line, in, in initial line. We have two subproofs. We have one proof of p arrow r we have one proof of q arrow r and because we have both of those coming out to the same consequent in our next line so line n in this case we can just write r we can write our consequent because whether it's just p true just q true or both true we get r in this case this is one where you might have to see it in action so to justify this we do is we write i we write uh, J to K, and we write K to L, and we would call this disjunction elimination. So there's three sets of justification. There is the initial statement with OR, there is the first proof of P to R, and there is the second proof of Q to R, which lets us write down R in the end. So this is disjunction elimination. Basically, P or Q, what happens if we have just P? What happens if we have just Q? We get to the same result for either or, okay, then this result R will be final. That will happen regardless of which one is true. Okay, and we'll see this in action with the three practice questions after we introduce the rules. The last rule is called reductio ad absurdum, also known as uh, negation introduction or negation elimination, depending on which way you go. Uh, some textbooks would also call this a proof by contradiction. So to explain this, imagine I have some fact A, and I don't believe that it's true. I, I think that if A is true, we'll run into a problem. So I assume A, and what happens, well, in some cases, is I might find that B is true, and I might find that not B is true. Now, this is problematic because we know that B and not B is a contradiction. They cannot both be true at the same time. 
So because this happens, when we take a look on the left, where at line i we have a, then we get b and not b in some subproof, uh, what that means is that we get not a as our final result, because we have assumed that a is true, but then we run into a contradiction. So our assumption has to be false. It cannot be the case that a is true. It must be that not a is true, because if a is true, we run into a problem. So that can't happen. It must be not a. So this is what reductio ad absurdum is for. This is how you introduce a negation to a statement. You assert the truth of something, you find a contradiction. Oh, that thing you asserted can't be true. It must be the negation of that. And to justify this, we would just do uh, i to k, and I call this RAA. You might call this not introduction, not elimination, depending on which way it goes. Uh, but typically, the rule that we use here is more like not introduction. Let's say we did something like not A, then we got B and not B. Our end result would be not not A, but then we could just use double negation to get rid of those two negations. So now that we've introduced the rules, let's see these in action. So for example one, I want to show that A arrow B and not B gives me not A. Okay, so for this, let's set up our little diagram here. So I have one assumption. My assumption is that I have a arrow B and not B. Okay, so this I can just call this a hypothesis or I can call it an assumption. This is line one. Now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use and elimination on one just so I can separate these into two well-formed formulas that can be used. So I'll get a arrow b, and I'll get uh, not and b, I'll get not b. So this is line one for both of these, and this is and elimination. Okay, so I need to prove not a. So to do this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a subproof, and I'm going to assume that a is true. And we're going to see what happens here. So this is a new hypothesis, A is true, we'll find some contradiction, and then we're gonna get not A out of it, hopefully. So I have A, I need to bring some things into my subproof that I've seen before so we can do something. So line two, we have A arrow B. So from line two, I'm doing reiteration. Now that I have A and I have A arrow B, I can use modus ponens to get B out of it. So from line four and line five, I use modus ponens, A, A arrow B, therefore we have B. Now in line three, well I should say, we have B now, but in line three, one of our assumptions was that we had not B. So what I want to do is I want to bring this in to our subproof as well. I want to reiterate that. So from line three, I've reiterated the fact that we have not B. At this point, what do we have? We have B and we have not B in our subproof. Therefore, this assumption that we had with A, that it was true, this just can't be true. Because if A is true, we get a contradiction. So it must be the case that not A is true. So this was from lines 4 to 7 by reductio ad absurdum, or by negation introduction, depending on your textbook. So this is a proof that A arrow B and not B gives us not A. And this actually has a special uh, name for this. This is called modus tollens. So it's the opposite of modus ponens. Remember, if you have A arrow B and you get A, you get B. But in this case, if you have A arrow B and you have not B, what you get as a result is you get not A. So some systems use this as theorems. At this point, if you wanted, you could use modus tollens anytime you want in a proof because we've shown that it works. But we're still going to try to keep using just our basic rules for the rest of the examples. But this is how you prove modus tollens, using just the assumptions of uh, conjunction, introduction, elimination, hypotheses, reiteration, modus ponens, and uh, proof by contradiction, or reductio ad absurdum. Okay, let's do example number two. Show that not A or B, and not A arrow B, gives us B. Okay, I see an or in here, so we're going to have to use our new best friend, 
con uh, disjunction elimination, likely. So I'm going to turn some lines on just so that way everything is neat and orderly. So in line one and line two, I'm going to introduce our assumption. So we have not A or B. That's our first hypothesis. And we have not A, arrow B. That's our second hypothesis. Okay, so that's height and height. Now, we need to prove B. Okay, well, we have not a arrow B, so we can't really do anything with that. We're going to use that for modus ponens, but we have not a or B. So I guess the strategy here that we can think about is, well, let's take not a or B and let's get B out of it. So we're going to use disjunction elimination. To do this, I'm going to set up two subproofs. I'm going to have a subproof where I assume that not A is true. So this is a hypothesis. And then I'm going to have a subproof down here where I assume that B is true as a hypothesis. And if both of those get me to the same result, I can use disjunction elimination and I can claim B, hopefully. So uh, let's do line three first. That's our first assumption, not A. Well, in line four, I'm going to reiterate not A arrow B. So we can do modus ponens. So this is two, this is a reiteration. So in line five, I get B. And this is from three and four and modus ponens. So I have not A, I have not A arrow B, therefore I get B. In line six, that starts the next subproof. And the nice thing about this is it's just B. So I've assumed B. But because I've assumed B, I get B back. So just to satisfy how the rule works, I have just reiterated B from our assumption. So at this point, if we assume not A, we got to B. If we assumed B, we got to B. And we had this initial condition that we had either not A or B. So because no matter which one we choose to be true, we get B out of it. Now, in line 8, I can just claim that B is in fact true. So this comes from line one, where we had our initial hypothesis. We had a subproof from lines three to five that shows us if we have not A, we have B. We have a subproof from lines six to seven that shows us if we have B, then we get B. And this was all just disjunction elimination. So this is how we can use that in an actual proof. So that was example number two with disjunction elimination. Let's remove the lines. This is how it looks without any of the lines. We have one more example to do in this video, and we need to show that A arrow B arrow C and not B arrow not A and A and D gives us C. So this one is a little bit more complicated than the other ones, and that's okay. So let's set up this proof. Uh, we have three assumptions this time, so I will make enough room for three assumptions. We have A, arrow B, arrow C in line one. In line two, we have not B, arrow, not A. And in line three, we have A and D. Okay, and we want to prove C. So just by looking at this, it might not be obvious what to do right away. In fact, I don't think it's actually super obvious what to do right away, but what I do know is that we have a D in A and D, and I don't think this is going to be useful at all. So what I'm going to do is in line four, I'm just going to use conjunction elimination to get A. So this is on line three, we use conjunction elimination. I don't think there's gonna be any need at all to use D in this proof, because there's nothing else that uses D. So let's just do conjunction elimination, get A. Now, line one has A arrow B arrow C. So because I have A now, and I have A arrow B arrow C, in line five, I can use modus ponens to get me B arrow C. So that's from line one and line four, modus ponens. Hmm, okay. So line two is, is interesting, right? Because if we remember back to the proof we just did, <laughs> where we had A arrow B, and not B gives us not A, that was example one. Uh, it looks like we have not B arrow not A. We have A, therefore we should get B out of it. 
<laughs> now, if we could use modus tollens as a theorem, then we could do this right away. However, that's not in our assumptions right now. We're just using the rules that we have, so we should probably do uh, the same thing here as before. So what are we going to assume? We're going to start a new subproof. That's going to be our next step. And in that subproof, I don't know how long the subproof is going to be, but I am going to assume that we have not B. Because if we get not B, we're going to get not A, right? And we already have A, so we'll find a contradiction. That's at least my reasoning for why I'm choosing this. So we introduce a new hypothesis. I'm going to do some reiteration. So in line seven, I'm going to bring not B, arrow not A, into our subproof. So that's from line two, and that's a reiteration. Now I'm going to apply modus ponens on line six and seven to get not A. So we had not B, not B arrow not A, therefore we have not A. Okay, in line nine, I'm going to reiterate line four, since we know that A is true, we've already proven that, so we can bring that into a subproof. At this point, we now have not A and we have A. So because we have both of those things, we have a contradiction, so we know that our initial assumption of not B being true is false. This means that not not B is true. So from line six to nine, we did negation introduction or reductio ad absurdum. So in line 11, we'll just clean this up by using double negation on line 10, since not not B is the same thing as B. Okay, are we done yet? No, we have to prove C. One more step. In line five, we have B arrow C. In line 11, we have B. So at this point, in line 12, Let's just give it space, why not? We can get C out of it. So this is from five, this is from 11, and this is modus ponens, and because we have ended with C, the proof is complete. So this is the steps of proving that A arrow B arrow C, not B arrow not A, and A and D proves C, using only the eight or nine rules that we've been given as like assumptions in our system right now. So those were the three practice questions. If you have any questions, as always, you can post them in the comments below. But I have some extra practice that you can do. And a video with solutions for these will be up in 24 hours. So you can either do these in the comments, do them on your own, however you want to do it. And uh, we will go over the solutions next video. So if you have any questions, as always, post them in the comments below. And I will get to you when I can.